January, I opened up the uh, Wall Street Journal and I saw an article on the front page about Huss. And when I saw the name, I felt like a jolt in my heart because I remembered Rudolf Huss was the commandant of Auschwitz. He was responsible in killing part of my family, my sister Goldie, my little brother Tuli, and many other members. But when I kept on reading, I found out this is his grandson, Reiner Hurst. And this man is doing exactly what I'm doing, going from school to school and country to country and preaching tolerance, love instead of hate. Well, when I saw this, I called my daughter. I said, Gail, you have to find a way. I'd like to talk to this young man. And which she did. We had a phone conversation for over an hour. And when I came out to Germany, we met. And we spent the whole day together in planning, finding out what exactly he is doing. He's finding out what I am doing. And we became very close. This man, remember, he didn't have to do what he is doing. I feel, as a survivor, I feel that survival thrusts upon me a mission to talk about it, tell this world, keep the memory alive. This man didn't have to do it. He divorced himself from his whole family to do something so noble. I only wish there were more and more people like you. <laughs> Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I say thank you as well to Mr. Michael Berenbaum. I met him in 2014 at Auschwitz, and I got the honor to go with him on a very special the private tour around the villa of my grandfather, which was not his villa, it was an occupied villa from a Polish citizen, and they only got two chan yeah, a chance to leave the house or get over the wall. That means they get killed immediately. So, and a special thanks to Gail, as well to Ben, to invited us to such an event here. It's the second event we have together. The first one was in, in Vegas, so everything goes rush. <laughs> as well for us, well, we had always a, a long distance flight to come here. So, and I hope you en enjoy a little bit what we are doing. Some of you will, will know about me, some of you will not know about me or the legacy of my family, but Mr. Bierenbaum explained it very well. So, for, for those who, who don't know about me, my name is Rainer Hurst, I'm 50 years old. I'm father of four kids and two grandchildren, beloved grandchildren. So my daughter was 15, a uh, granddaughter was 15. She was last year the first time with me at Auschwitz. And it was a deal we had when I said, when you're 15, you're old enough to go with me to Auschwitz. And immediately when she had her birthday, she called me and I was in Auschwitz with a Swedish student group. And she said, grandpa, do you remember what you offered to me? I'm 50 now, I'm packed. When did we go to Auschwitz? <laughs> So and she also said to me that when I sometimes will retire, so she will do my job. She like it and she will help the world to get a little bit more or better like it is right now. And I have made it to my task not to be silent in my heritage, not to be silent how it is in, to grow up in such a family. Well, mostly of the people don't see only outside, not inside. And all these ideology facts are still alive in these families. But they not pronounce it outside. So outside, these are all gentlemen. And they don't talk about what happens. So it is a, it's a well-kept secret inside these families as well. So when I give you, I give you a, a, a little story, so maybe you, you can think what it is uh, to be born in such a family. I had a friend in an age 
10, 11, so it is, uh, yeah, he lived two houses away from me. What I did not know, well, it was not important for us in that age, he was a Jew. And the half of his family was killed as well on different camps. And what we found out later on, the last part of his family died on, on the Dead March from Auschwitz. So when it was there, so I loved that family and we are still in contact until today. And his father came home, and he, really friendly man, and said, are you interested to go with us to uh, Pesach? I have no clue what is Pesach at a, in that age. He said, oh, sounds good. And he said, yeah, it's a very, very nice and an open fast. You will like it, so like all the fasts we had with him. And I said, okay, but uh, I have first asked my dad to get permission. So I told him that I ran over, naturally full of joy, run home to my father to ask for permission. He was sitting as usual in his chair in the living room with a bottle of beer between his tights. We could not simple interfere, but had to wait until he turned his gaze to us and we got invited to speak to him. This is what happened. I submitted my request in all of this time. I have never forgotten this moment. As if he had seen or heard the ghost, he shot out of his chair like a rocket, slamming the beer in a harsh moment on, on the table. Broke my nose, it starts bleeding. He grabbed my arm and pulled me in my room, locked the door outside. And the rest of the day, I didn't hear anything, I didn't saw anything, I got no water, no food, I was not able to go on the toilet. It was dark outside, my father opened the door again, comes in, slapped me again, and it comes a, a sentence in a, yeah, like a warning. I forbid you to associate with the Jewish rabble. That was the first contact I had with the name hers or the family and Jews. And the next morning, I went out of the house. My mom wanted to, what do you call it, to color a little bit my eye and my nose. Well, it was, everything was, was green and blue. And I went out the house, and my father made a big sign on the garden fence door, which stands on it, Jews not allowed here. That was a pound, and there are several of these stories which, which I grow up. So later on, I, became, I, I was sent to a to a boarding school. I was 11 years old, and 11 years old kids, and I think mostly of you had kids in that age, we were rebels. So we were hungry in that boarding school. I took my suitcase with other colleagues out of my room, went down in the basement, and broke in, in the kitchen to stole food. When we get out the security, they caught us bring us on Monday to the director, and he said, okay, you have to go to the gardener. That is, what he called us, to, to bring me on sentence for it, with the rest of my colleagues. What we didn't know was the gardener was also a survivor of Auschwitz. So we had the, the number on his, on his arm. In that moment, when he got the list from the director, who was working now there for two weeks, that was the director offered to us, he saw the name Hus like survivors always did. And I think you're in the back. You saw the picture before. That was Esther Bejerano. She's a survivor of Auschwitz as well. And I met her on the Peace Festival in Berlin. And we're sitting half an hour beside. And then she, when the music was a little bit softer, she, she touched my shoulder and said, young man, what is your name? And I told her my name, and she raises up her hands in front of her eyes and said, oh my goodness. Hmm. <laughs> it was about seconds. Then he took her hand on my arm and said, oh my goodness, what a burden you carry on. So, but now I got back to the, to the gardener. So he went immediately back with a list to the secretary of the boarding school and asked about the uh, surname of my father. The secretary said, yeah, it's Hans Jürgen. So very normal. He went back and he was aware, well, he was a gardener at the camp and at the villa garden. So he was confirmed with, with the names of the kids. So he was aware I was out of that group, out of that family. 
And then my punishment again starts with a survivor. I have no clue about Auschwitz or all that stuff. I was not informed about my, yeah, nobody in my family was talking about it. It was a secret. The only thing my grandmother always said, what a, what a glorified soldier he was, what a beloved, behaved soldier he was, that he didn't do anything wrong, and, but nobody told me about Auschwitz. So Auschwitz was another planet, another country. So and then it's, uh, after these two weeks, my room colleagues went out of, of sentence, and I was there for another two and a half months. So they talked to the, to the director, as well as a German teacher, and explained everything, so I went as well out. And then the German teacher took me to Dachau, where Ben was liberated. And it was the first time in an age of 11 where I put my foot on a concentration campground. And then we went in, so when someone was at Dachau, they have barracks on the right, you went in, it is like a, like a museum. And I saw a lot of these posters and scripts on the wall where it said, later on, Rudolf Hurst became the commandant of the biggest extermination camp in the middle of the 20th century. I said, oh my goodness. So, but you cannot, there was no, nothing with internet or something like that we had today. So I called my father at home and I asked him, what is about our grandfather, my grandfather? And he said, forget it, that was a mistake. It was Rudolf Hess, had nothing to do with us. So when I was an 11-year-old child, he said, okay, you can trust your father in that way. But it was a lie. And we had several of these lies. Later on, when I, when I was, uh, yeah, became a father in the age of 17, well, some of you will count, <laughs> and think, oh, granddaughter, 14, 15, mm, that man looks not 60 years old. <laughs> so uh, he called my own son a bastard and said he will not have that this, that this bastard use his name Hus. So they were proud of this name. And two years later, I cut the lines in 1985 to the whole of the Hus family. I never had a contact until today. I smashed them out of my life, completely. So in that, it's, it's a little bit uh, part of, of my story. But I think what, what people also are interested in is about they, they ask me about footsteps. What is footsteps? People not uh, really know what is footsteps. <laughs> so footsteps is, is a team. Now I give you a, what we have written for friends or in our page. We the footsteps team is built from the need and hope of building a better future. A team which hope to educate, learn and remember the horrors of the Holocaust remembering the victims and keeping their vices alive. So their stories remain in our hearts and minds. Footsteps that not only focus on the Holocaust, we work against the rise of hate within our communities and countries to build a future from our past and present challenging hate and intolerance. The Footsteps team is dedicated to bringing the victims and survivor stories to the hearts of the listeners. The team is a unique set of individuals who knows knowledge and research focus on different topics, areas of the Holocaust. So in that team, nobody can be a member before he not was at Auschwitz, to visit Auschwitz. So that, that is one of our paragraphs in the team. Well, we have a lot of people, they talk about Auschwitz, they talk about Dachau, but they never set a foot in. So they have no clue what it is, and you have to feel Auschwitz. And I think Mr. Berenbaum will give me right in that moment. You cannot talk about a topic and you have no, no clue and no feeling about it. So when I go to Auschwitz, and I was now 17 times there, with students, with our students, with part of my family, like my granddaughter and my kids, so they all visited Auschwitz. And these members who help me are health nurses, education students, which wrote books about the experiments of doctors at Auschwitz. So it's a well-educated well group, a teacher here from Florida, from Ocala, Debbie Callahan. So she is now working for us here in America, so that we cannot managing all that stuff around. That is footstep, and we called it footsteps, uh, about six million footsteps. 
So we were thinking a long time which name we would get, gave our, our team. And we became a foundation soon, so we're preparing right now. And we said, okay, the only thing which left back are the footsteps of these people who went to the gas chamber, who were slaughtered on, on different places, not only in Auschwitz, were slaughtered for nothing, only for religion, for skin, or something like that. So a created enemy, what we have today as well with the Muslims. And believe me, I, w I was talking about Muslims. My oldest daughter married this year in May a Muslim. And I was really shocked when she came home, and it was that time in Germany where Pegida, it's, it's a, what do you call it, it's like an act, activism group against Muslims, haters, full of haters as well anti-Semitism inside this group. So it was a mixed up. And she came home and said that, do you think it can repeat itself with the Muslims? What our grandfather did with the Jews? And believe me, in my age, you don't ask for such a question. I said, okay, let me think about it. But it was very fast to, to give her an answer. It can. If nobody take a stand, if we not stand up, and fight against intolerance or hate, or educate our youth to give them the chance. Well, I think, like the German student said, let the past away. We are living modern times, yeah. But without knowing about the past, we have no now and we have no future. We have to look back sometimes, not daily. I agree. But sometimes we have to look back to see, and we teach our kids always, don't touch uh, maybe hot things. Why we don't do it here, on that way? So that is what we are challenging right now. And I go over 70 schools a year, only in Europe. I have Skype meetings. Last year it was about 35 or 36 Skype meetings around the world. I have a lot of, like Mr. Birenbaum, education staff, I went to Auschwitz, I went with students there, I went with historians there, with TV teams. So we use any possibility to educate the world and to get them free from, like Ben said, amnesia. Well, without, and all of us, we have neighbors. We have to be tolerant. So look about it. And on the end, I will show you uh, I think the, the guys will have ready it. There is a, a group from Sweden called the, the Social Use Democrats. It's different to the American Social Democrats. So these are the good ones <laughs> in Sweden. And it was a, a group in an age between 16 and 24. And they called me and said, Mr. Hirsch, are you interested to be part of our video? I said, what kind of video? Yeah, it's for the European election in, in, in Europe, where we saw that anti-Semitism, racism, and all these right-wing movements, right-wing parties, are gaining ground. And they're right. Five years ago, they had around two, three seats. The last election, they had 172 seats. So that shows that all these powerful times, these like my grandmother would say, good old times came back now. On another stage, on another level, more effective like we had it 70 years ago. We used a better technology, like our smartphones, tablets, internet. You can spread a hate message now to millions in seconds. And very effective. You not use your original name, you can go as an anonymous, as an avatar, gravatar, whatever else. You can go on the internet and can spread it. And now, maybe to the end, uh, Gail will show you the video these young people made and get a lot of prizes for it. And it was a powerful step. Thank you for letting me talk here.